Our national debt now stands at about $32 trillion. How did we get here? Whose fault is it? Republicans? Democrats? Well, the answer is yes. Both parties are at fault for different reasons. Republicans come to this floor and will come to this floor today saying, we need unlimited military spending. And Democrats will come to this floor and say, we need unlimited welfare spending. And guess what happens? They compromise. People say Washington doesn't compromise. They compromise all of the time. That's what this debt deal, debt deal that's before us is, is compromise. But the compromise is always to spend more money. How do we know that? The debt deal that's been crafted by Biden and McCarthy is an unlimited increase in the debt ceiling. See, historically, when we raise the debt ceiling, it would be $100 billion or $200 billion or, God forbid, a trillion dollars. It was a dollar amount. This debt ceiling will go up till January 2025. How many dollars will be borrowed? As many as they can possibly shovel out the door. It will be how much money can you shovel out the door until January 2025? That's how much we will spend. Is there a dollar amount? No. How much can you shovel it out and how fast can you shovel it out? There will be no restraint from this debt deal. There is a pretense. There is a playing around the edges as if, oh, there might be a cut here or there might be a cut there. There are no cuts. Why? Two-thirds of your spending is entitlement spending. The on-budget entitlement spending is Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, and other programs. They are called mandatory and no one ever looks at them. They go on in perpetuity. This is what drives the deficit. Who took them off the table? How come there's no discussion of this? Actually, Republicans took them off the table because they fear being criticized by the Democrats. It's being used in the presidential campaign. Let's not talk about the entitlements, but that's two-thirds of what gets spent every year. So if you don't talk about the entitlements, if you don't talk about mandatory spending, you're frankly not a serious person, and you will not make a serious dent in this problem. So we've taken off the table all mandatory spending, no discussion of it. Does this mean they're in good shape, that Medicare and Social Security and all these programs are in good shape? Heck no, they're not in good shape. They're all running out of money. They're headed towards bankruptcy. Is anybody brave enough to reform them? No, not a damn thing's going to be done for any of them. But when you take them off the table, take all the entitlement spending off the table and do nothing about it, now we're down to one-third of the budget. So now you're going to try to do budgetary reform while excluding two-thirds of the spending on one-third. But it's worse than that. The one-third they call discretionary spending. It's about $1.6 trillion. Half of that's military. So they took that off the table. So mandatory spending entitlements is going up 5% under this deal, because that's what it's been doing for, for years and years. It's going up at 5%. The military is going up at 3%. So what are we left for? What are we left looking at? We're looking at one-sixth of the budget, somewhere between 15 and 20%. A small sliver of the budget, it's called non-military discretionary, and they think we're going to do some kind of fiscal reform on that small sliver of government. Well, guess what? You can't do it. You can eliminate all of the non-military discretionary money. Leave the mandatory in place, leave the military in place, increase them, eliminate all of this other chunk of money, and you still never balance a budget. See, there was a time when there was a conservative movement, the conservative movement had a voice in Washington. There's still some voice, but not much. But there was a time when people on the conservative side of this said, well, in order to be a thoughtful, rational, realistic, strong response to the budget deficit, you would have to balance your budget in five years. In fact, we voted on a constitutional amendment in this body, and every Republican voted for it. But it said you had to balance five years. Why five years? Well, because most of the plans that lasted longer than that, most of the plans that balanced in like years 9 and 10, were basically somebody fudging the numbers and hoping something good would happen in year 9 or 10, but the only years they actually had any power over the first year or two, there weren't very many cuts. And they always had unrealistic expectations in year 10. So what have I done? I've said, let's look at balancing this in five years. What would it take? So about five or six years ago, I began introducing something called the Penny Plan. And what would it do? It would cut one penny out of every dollar. 
it actually would balance. Actually, the first year I did it, I didn't even cut 1%. I froze spending for five years, and the, balance, the budget would have balanced. But the trick is, or not the trick, the truth is that you have to cut all spending or freeze all spending. You can't just freeze a sliver of the spending. So people have talked about, oh, there's a 1% trigger on the, non, on the discretionary spending. That's $16 billion. They're going to add $4 trillion in debt over the next two years. And they say, but by golly, we might save $16 billion, which even that is not going to happen because the trigger isn't real, doesn't have muscle, and will be evaded. But the thing is, is that if we were to balance the budget over five years, what would happen is there now needs to be about a 5% cut of all the spending each year for five years, and then the budget would balance. And you say, well, isn't it just a number? What would that mean to real people? Why do I care whether the budget is balanced? Well, go to the grocery store. Go to buy gas. Go to buy anything. Go to pay your rent. Look at your cost of living, and look at what inflation is doing to you. Who does inflation hurt the worst? Those on fixed income and those of the working class because they don't have extra expendable income. Most of their income goes towards things that they have to purchase each month. But where does inflation come from? A senator from Indiana described it accurately. We run a debt, this place spends money we don't have, and where's the deficit made up for? We sell that debt to the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve buys it, and he's like, wow, this is a great system. We spend money we don't have, we print up these things called treasury bills, the Federal Reserve comes over and then buys them, Wow, we can just do anything we want. We have the printing press. But when they create new money and that new money enters into circulation, that is inflation. Inflation is an increase in the money supply. And when you increase the money supply, you chase the same amount of goods, you're going to chase the prices right up. And that's where inflation comes from. So the debt is not just a number. The debt is about the value of your paycheck. It's about how far your paycheck goes. So right now, we're in a bit of a spiral. We've had 9% inflation. It's a little lower now, but we've had as high as 9%. And I think the cost of living increase for Social Security went up 9 to match that. But you'll actually find people who say, you know, even with the 9% increase, I still can't buy everything I need. I'm actually still being squeezed. But it's a bait and switch. It's because your government isn't honest with you. If your government wanted to be honest with you, and they say, we're going to be everything to everyone, and we're going to give you stuff, and it's funny because we have this comparison sometimes with Sweden and people say, and many Democrats will say, we want to be Sweden, we want to be Sweden and we're going to give you everything and we're going to have a big government that coddles you from, from cradle to grave. But you know how they do it in Sweden? With a balanced budget. And I'm not advocating we become Sweden, but they balance their annual budget every year. You know how they, got, they have all that free stuff to give everybody? How they have a safety net that includes everything, including college, free health care, everything? They tax everybody, enormous amount of tax. Over here, the bait and switch is they'll say, we're just going to tax the rich people. It's easy. Just tax the rich people. They don't do that in Sweden, though. In Sweden, they tax everybody. It's a 60% income tax beginning at $60,000 a year. So everybody pays. The middle class pays. So if we wanted to be honest and we we're going to say, we're going to give you this massive safety net. You don't have to work. Everybody can have a basic income. You do all of this we would be honest, or we should be honest, and say it would take massive taxes. Instead, there's a dishonesty, but the dishonesty is on both sides of the aisle. The Democrats say welfare is free, and the safety net's free, and Social Security's free, and all these things are free. What do Republicans say? The military-industrial complex is free. You can have all the weapons you want. You can give hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons to Ukraine, and it won't cost anything, because we'll just print it up. See, there were times in our history when you went through a war, and the devastation of war in World War II, that people actually suffered, and you could see the suffering, and people felt like they had to pay something. But now we just put it on the tab. But there is a point at which the tab gets so large that there can be something precipitous happen. The question has always been, is this a gradual problem where we'll just have to deal with a little inflation, 5%, 10% here, or is there a point at which there's a calamity. If you look at the stock market for the last 100 years, uh, some people will point to like seven different days in which like 80, 90% of the downturn occurred in seven days in the last century. Is there a possibility of calamity when we're so destructive to our dollar, when we're so destructive to good sense? I think the American people want more from us. 
Recent polls have said 60% of Americans say don't raise the debt ceiling without significant reform. 43 Republicans, 44 of us actually said we want significant reforms before we raise the debt ceiling. But then the devil's in the details. The devil's in concluding what is significant and what is not significant. So what will end up happening, my prediction here is almost every Democrat will vote, vote to raise the debt ceiling and about half of the Republicans will vote. It'll be a 75-25 vote, and in the end, the debt ceiling will go up. People say, well, that's good, we didn't have a calamity, we didn't, the stock market didn't crash because we didn't pay our debt. But you might wanna ask yourself, is this really a contrived controversy? Is there really a reason in which we would ever default? Is there a reason why we wouldn't make our interest payment? We bring in $5 trillion, and our interest payment's $500 billion. So that would be like you make $100,000 and your mortgage payment's $10,000. If you made $100,000 a year and your mortgage payment was at $10,000, is there any chance you would ever default? Is there any reason you wouldn't cut your other expenditures to prioritize your interest so you don't get kicked out of your house? That's what every American family would do, but we don't do it up here. So we threaten default. We scare the markets and say, oh, no, we'll default if the debt ceiling doesn't come up. No, we would default only if we refuse to cut spending. So we spend a trillion dollars more than comes in every year. That's the problem. If we simply said, we're going to pay the $500 billion, 10% of our revenue for next year, we're going to pay the interest no matter what, and guess what, we'll tell the marketplace, we're never going to default. We are, we are never going to default, we will always do that. That would be great, the market would go gangbusters and say, we no longer have to worry about those knuckleheads, they've finally decided they're going to pay their interest and they always will. Then what would happen? Well, we wouldn't have enough money for everything. So then we, we should look at where we could save money. The problem has always been this. Republicans point at Democrats and say, we don't like your programs, let's cut your programs. Democrats look at Republicans and say, no, no, don't cut our programs, cut yours. Everybody's don't cut mine, cut yours. That's why I've taken the approach and continue to take the approach, we should cut everything across the board. In the past, there were always like conservatives who say, let's get rid of public television. Let's get rid of Sesame Street and Big Bird. And they'd get so much grief over it. It's like, why do that? You, you're not balancing the budget over Big Bird. Take 1% of Big Bird's budget. Take 1% of everybody's budget. And what would, that, what would that bring about? It would bring about more conservation of the dollar. It would bring about more restraint and more reform. I'll end with this. People say, where would you cut? I would say everywhere. But I can give you, on the tip of my hand, ridiculous stuff that should have 100% cut, but is never cut and goes on and on. In the early 1970s, William Proxmire, a conservative Democrat, pointed out that the National Science Foundation was spending $50,000 to study what makes people fall in love. Now, that's a better, I think, topic for Cosmopolitan magazine than it is for a government study. Nowadays, it's gone up. We spent a million dollars having young people take selfies of themselves while smiling and then looking at it later in the day to see if looking at pictures of yourself smiling makes you a happier person. That costs you a million bucks. We spent a million and a half studying the mating call of the Panamanian frog to see if the mating call of the country frogs was different than the city frogs. We spent nearly a million dollars studying the Japanese quail to see if they're more sexually promiscuous when they're on cocaine. I think we could have just polled the audience on that one. This is the kind of ridiculous stuff, but does it get better? I complain about this every year and all the time, and everybody shakes their head and says, no way, why are we doing that? The National Science Foundation, we increased their budget 50% last year. People said, oh, we have to compete with China. So let's give the National Science Foundation more money. We, we've almost increased our budget by 50%. The people are studying why you go on dates, why you're happy, why the male frogs, you know, what their mating call is. This is the craziness, but it never gets better because we always spend more money. So my amendment would do this. My amendment would reduce the spending in real terms. We'd actually spend less money next year than last year. It'd be a 5% reduction in money and you'd spend less each year, and over five years, you'd balance your budget, and then we'd be on course to balance. People say, why not? Who can do this? Half of Europe does it. Sweden balances their budget. Germany balances their budget. 
Over half of the countries of Europe run an annual balanced budget. Our profligacy and our spending is catching up to us. I say we act now, and I recommend a yes vote on my amendment. Thank you, Mr. President.